these things. These are interesting and worth doing and make my life better and help me have a better impact on others. I'm just going to do it because I love it. Then maybe people will say, what have you been doing this weekend? You seem happier. But if you started out with trying to convince them, look, you guys, this is amazing. There's this weekend course, and it's about burnout prevention and recovery, and there's this nun. She's coming from overseas. You should really come. They'll be like, meh, <laughs> nah. <laughs> Right? Um, or if you get excited about some like new diet, new exercise, new book, right? Have you ever read a book and it's been a beautiful, amazing book and then you want everyone to read this book? And you're sort of thrusting at them, like buying it for everyone and they're like, great, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you just really loved it and someone says, hey, I need a book to read, you could hand it to them and they might read it because there's not that kind of pressure and tension and need for approval around the thing that you love. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that need for approval around the thing that you love, that need for recognition around the thing you're interested in, again, makes you very tired and needy. Yeah, it makes a neediness around you. Yeah, so having the attitude by myself alone will probably mean you have more good company. But even if you don't, you're fine because it's worthwhile enough. Yeah, that the idea itself is sustaining. Do you have some questions about that? Yeah. I, I have uh, sometimes this feeling of I'm, I'm, uh, this is valuable to me, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here on this course, this uh, two days. But then uh, uh, I also uh, feel the judgment around mm. me that I'm uh, being egoistic. Mm. Yeah. It's it's just it is, yeah, people will judge you. I, before, before I was a nun, when I had you know, a job and a relationship and a cat and a house and things back then, um, I remember the person I was with very annoyed when I would go sit down and do my meditation. Yeah? And, and then I, I, I realized, I, you know what? They will benefit from me being on my cushion, whether they realize it or not. Um, and I would say, look, this is better for the whole household <laughs> if I go away for 20 minutes. Just trust me. You're going to have the better version of me if you let me go for 20 minutes. Yeah. And if you don't have the better version of me, you can tell me that. But, you know, we all have our thing. I can sort of have some confidence of, I know that this is useful, you know. You do your gardening or your running or your whatever, you know. We all have different things that sustain us. You don't really have to justify it. Just live very, very true to the fact that it is making you happy. And then you don't have to apologize. Yeah? If it's genuinely making you happy and genuinely making you more effective to the people around you, you don't have to explain yourself unless they're genuinely curious in a friendly way. And that comes down to confidence again, right? Confidence. <coughs> yep. And what in doing absolutely. And, yeah. Yep, it's this confidence. And you know, for years when I was a kid, my parents did not understand my Buddhism at all, right? When I was a little kid and you know, 12, 13, 14 and going once a week to the little Zen center, they didn't really get it, but they're like, well, it's not causing any trouble, right? Like, I'd rather her do this weird thing than, I don't know, go party, whatever, kid. And then the years go by, and they're kind of like, wow, she's really into it now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right? She's getting, it's getting a little much, right? And so I remember that at one point they said, uh, if you really want to keep being a Buddhist, will you please do a Bible study class first so you know what it is you're giving up? And so I did. I did. I had a confirmation class in the little Methodist church, and I thought, wow, Christians are nice. Anyway, I'm Buddhist. <laughs> right? and, um, but they were nice about it. But, you know, the thing is, is that I actually could not talk to my parents about Buddhist philosophy until maybe five years ago. It's been that long, right? It's quite a journey, though, right? From meeting your, one of your parents. Yeah. You know, very embracing all Right? Yeah. Yeah, Vicky's met my dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because what he really celebrates, you know. Yeah. And combines it into his own practices now, too, right? Totally. Okay. Yeah, totally. But anytime I've been like, you guys, I have this really cool idea I want to tell you. They're like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. 
the, I mean, the first conversation I had with my mother about Buddhism was via a cartoon, right? It was like a Buddhist cartoon with a cute cat and a cute little monk and like some cute thing happening. And this is, you know, my mother is a lawyer, right? She has many, many degrees. She's much smarter than me. It's not like she's an unintelligent person. She's very educated, um, very smart. But Buddhism was like really confronting to her. And she didn't even really know what it was, but it was confronting. But they knew it made me happy, and so they gave me space. But the only time we had conflict was when I tried to explain myself. If I stopped trying to explain myself and just lived it, we had peace. Yeah? Just lived it, then we had peace. They'd be like, I don't know what you're doing, I don't care what you're doing, but you are nicer when you come home. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and, you know, so slowly, slowly, right? And then they realize, wow, she's been a nun now for like 15 years. So anyway, what do you do all day? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, slowly, slowly, but I still have to be careful to like not get excited and be like, oh my God, they've asked. Oh my God, okay, I've got resources. <laughs> you know, I get so excited. But, you know, because I want them to be happy. I want them to have a better way of life and this format works for me, but I have to be patient and realize they have wisdom, they have life experience, they have lots of ways of understanding the world that I don't. And just because these strategies work for me doesn't mean it suits their personality or suits their learning style. So wait to be asked. You don't have to prove anything. Right? You don't have to justify anything. Just live it and they will see the result. You just have to be a bit patient because they won't understand the result right away. It's that unapologetic. Yeah, you don't have to apologize for doing something that's worthwhile. Yeah. So the opposite. Um, yeah. Kids, yes. How should you learn, teach them these thoughts? Because their teachers mm. uh, teach these kind of thoughts. So absolutely, and I have no idea how to approach them. Or I have one kid, yeah, four, so it's yeah. maybe not the right time yet. But yeah, still, it would be nice to yeah to do something, stuff, helping in a way to build yeah confidence instead of pride. Yeah, exactly. I feel like our society focuses on pride. A absolutely. Lot, so. I mean, we first ask ourselves, what did we learn from our parents? How did we learn from our parents? Did we learn because of what they yelled at us and what they disciplined us to do? Or did we learn from their example? You know, how did we learn from our own parents is an interesting thought process to have. Um, for better or for worse, because we learned some weird stuff from our parents too, yeah. <laughs> but we learned some good things about how to live in this world just from their example. So you're working on being a better and better example for your child. That's the first way. And the second way is to, I think, ask them more questions than tell them advice. Because when they're little, you know, you can kind of engage with their wisdom more directly. When they're teenagers, they have a whole kind of set of beliefs that have gotten a little bit hardwired, and so it's tricky. But when they're little, you know, say they're stamping on all the ants, right? They're stepping on all the bugs, and they're like, ha ha, squish, ha ha, squish. And you're going, oh dear, okay, hmm, be cool, just be cool. <laughs> um, darling, <laughs> so the reason why we don't step on ants is um, that might not be the approach that gets to them. What might get to them is to say, hey, do you think those little bugs are thinking anything? Are feeling anything? What do you think's going on for those little guys? Let's just watch them for a second. Look at that. They Look at, they're getting food. You need food too. Look at how we're the same. We're asking them questions. What do you think they're doing today? What's happening in their ant house? You know? And you're sort of asking them questions to help them understand this is a sentient being with a life that wants happiness, that doesn't want suffering. And then their conclusion will be, perhaps I won't smash them. And maybe I'll keep smashing them a little bit just to prove I can, because I'm a willful child. But when you're not looking, I might build them a house. Do you know what I mean? You know, so when they're really little like that, um, you have to be skillful, but it actually can go really deeply for them to try and bring out their compassion and their empathy that is actually kind of there in its raw stages, more accessible than when they get older, you know, and just kind of grow that. So you're not shaming them, you're asking them. 
yeah, like this. But I'm sure you know you you guys who are parents could talk together about some interesting ideas and even develop some kids programming together. And there's some really beautiful Buddhist books out there. There's some really Buddh beautiful Buddhist meditations um, for kids. I mean, when I teach kids to meditate, I play this bell and I say, all right, so listen to the bell until you can't hear it anymore and then put your hand up. Because then it's like a game. So they're learning focus, right? Um, and they kind of want to be the one with the best ears, <laughs> right? So there's a subtle competition there, right? But um, then you say, oh, great, okay, let's do it again. And then maybe you add, okay, and now count five breaths. You know, and you're just really patient, really small. But t sometimes the very simple concepts go more deeply into them because they don't have so much other stuff to taint it as we do. You know, so sometimes a very simple thing will land quite deeply. Yeah. So just, you know, experiment and talk to each other who are parents and what's worked for you. But, but there are ways. But the first one is to just be the example. You know, how do you want to show them stress relief? You know, like, Daddy's stressed today, so I'm going to do this and this to cope with my stress. Not pretending that Daddy never has stress. You know, show them how you choose to cope with it, and then they are learning that from you. You know? I mean, what do you guys think? A lot of you are parents. Yeah. I think just to, for children, is just to sit there and meditate, and then they will do it later. Mm. Uh, not saying anything. Yeah, right. You meditate, and then they're like, what are you doing? Yeah, but uh, it's uh, sit in the same room with them and meditate. Yeah. And, uh, give the example of your son. Yeah. Yeah, with my son, yes, it was. I, I've been meditating in, in the same room with him, and, and uh, <laughs> he's. The, haven't done anything. Yeah. But then he went to my neighbor and slept over there. And he was a bit like, oh, he couldn't sleep. And mm. then he sat there in meditation. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. When you're not watching, right? Yeah. And my mother told me yeah. that he was meditating and showing everyone how to oh, <laughs> This is great, right? It's really fun. It is. It is. And, you know, they have their little, like, child pride. So they're not going to do it while you're watching, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, they have a, um, in the early years, uh, they want to, they imitate what we grow up. Yeah. So it's, I think it's really important, like how we behave in that environment. Yeah. We like to, they look up to and want to do the same. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they are watching all the time, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Martin. I, yeah, I think it's been, um, I was reminded when you talked about the ants. Yeah. When our daughter was three years old. She was, or maybe a little younger, she was stepping on ants and yelling, I don't want to be a Buddhist child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Rebellion. <laughs> yeah. But then, um, then two years later, she was telling uh, her friends that um, she, they shouldn't hurt the ants because they've been their mothers in a previous Aww. life. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give them time, right? <laughs> Yeah, but my, my, I think something that um, is very helpful is also to, um, for example, we've been going to this place every summer called Palm uh, Village in mm. France, just for kids to be also surrounded with role models that aren't your parents. Yeah, yeah, that's like huge. For her seeing nuns and monks and yep. other people that have these strange ideas has been very, or even, you know, going to see Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, yeah to get other influences than parents trying to talk about meditation and boring stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, non-parental adults, yeah. yeah, that you trust, yeah, mentors and stuff, yeah. And uh, older kids that are doing it, you know, then they're, oh, that's cool, the older kids are doing it, or, you know, it's, I mean, it's delicate because we live in a dangerous world, but you keep your common sense and keep your eyes open and they can really learn a lot, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, didn't your parents do the right thing? <laughs> Evidently. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. And they would answer my questions as yeah. best as they knew how and say, I don't know, when they didn't know. I think that was a really beautiful thing they did. Yeah. And they supported you even though yeah. they didn't think the way you did. Exactly. They were like, all right, you can have a big picture of the Dalai Lama in your room, you weirdo. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, they gave me a book on comparative religions that they had read in college and sort of were like, here, <laughs> figure it out, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Why were they so scared about it? 
I don't know if they were scared. I, I think they were worried about cults. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Sense, yeah. yeah. And they, I think they were worried at some point. They were hoping maybe the nun thing, a regular Buddhist, okay, but becoming a nun meant no grandchildren. So they had to process some grief around that. Um, but you know, then they became foster parents and got their own grandkids. They were very proactive. So, <laughs> you know, we are not in charge of our parents' happiness. <laughs> yeah, they are in charge. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. one more question about this child. Sure, yeah. So my children also ask, uh, thanks for bringing up these children. It's been on my mind forever. My children ask me about that. Mm. But I'm the only Buddhist. Ah. Oh. Yeah. So I don't know what to answer actually. Are you their only parent or do they have no, another parent? No. I am living together with my husband. And do you uh, say what shall we tell them? <laughs> and you, is there a middle way between you? No, I don't think. Yeah? <laughs> so you could say that. You could say people have many different ideas so you have to find out for yourself. Okay. Yeah. So tell them the truth. You know, people have many ideas. There are lots of ideas. Daddy thinks, blah, blah, blah. Mama thinks, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to choose or pick sides or, you know, you can say, I'm going with mommy just because you have the lollies that day, right? <laughs> but, you know, tell them the truth and then, you know, they work it out. And, uh, and, and also whenever you can say, but we all agree it's good to be kind. Yeah, everybody agrees that's nice. You know, things like that. So you can say many opinions here, 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 but we all agree it's good to be kind. You know, as you get older, you can decide your own things. You could say, what do you think happens, darling? Because maybe she remembers, <laughs> right? Some of, sometimes they do, yeah. Yeah, sometimes little ones remember. I used to interview the little kids in the, in the group I had and say, what were you in your past life? And they would sometimes say very cute things like, I was a tiger, because they love tigers, <laughs> right? <laughs> so whether it was a memory, <laughs> who can say? <laughs> but just, you know, kind of exploring the idea with them was kind of interesting and fun. Um, you know, they can do with that what they like. So anyway, like this. Um, okay, so I guess just the, the last two pieces of this steadfastness we'll do and then um, break for lunch. And, um, and then after we come back from lunch, we can either have one big session or two little sessions with a tea break. Which would you prefer? Like one final big session or two little short ones with a tea break? Two. Two? 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 We'll end at four either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, end at four either way. Okay, we'll have two shorties so you can stretch and chat. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about this steadfastness of actions where you're really thinking by myself alone. Do you guys understand what's being said there? It's not like you have to be all alone in the forest or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one is this steadfastness or confidence with capability. So it's getting yourself rid of self-doubt. Self-doubt is a symptom of pride. It's the other side of pride. Yeah, pride thinks I'm these things, I'm amazing at those things. And then when you aren't, you think you're nothing and can't do anything. Confidence goes, ah, oh, I need more information, or I need more supplies, or more conditions, or more time, but it's not a fault of mine that I can't do this yet. So this capability is thinking, I will work for the welfare of all sentient beings, but right now I only really know what to do with these situations. So far. It's adding the word so far, or yet, to your sentences in your head. Yeah, I can't do that yet. Yeah, or I can do these things in a small way. If I keep working on it, I'll be able to do them in a larger way. Yeah, so you have the long view that understands power comes from repetition. And then we have this one of overcoming afflictions, which is really this like, um, it's this will that says, I refuse to follow negative states of mind anymore. I refuse. They are so used to taking over my life. Anger and attachment and jealousy and pride and ignorance. They are used to being the boss. My feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral are used to being the boss. If I feel nice, I'm going to have more of it. If I feel bad, it needs to get away. You know, you're, we're so used to these things dictating our choices. And that has not ended well. 
<laughs> that you're having this real confidence that says, I am actually more than my little animal responses. And when I'm awake, when I'm focused, I have the space to choose to choose the same old pattern or to choose something different. So you're having this real um, determination that is seeing that afflictions are not you. They're just habitual responses that have been hurting you. They came about through really natural, understandable stories. That's not the point. The point is that they're hurting you now and they're hurting others. And so you say, I refuse to listen to you, anger. Anger says, I have a lot of reasons why I should be here. And you say, I bet you do. I'm not listening. Yeah, I bet you have a lot of reasons to exist. I've gone through them, I think. Because we're adults now, right? We've gone through our reasons to be angry, our reasons to be attached. We've, we've gone through stuff. We've looked into our family of origin issues. Yes, we've looked into our societal influences. We know, we don't need to keep doing that again and again because that becomes a way to justify the existence of these negative states of mind which don't help us. Now, if you've never looked into the past, you might need to, right? To look at you know, how your family influenced you, how society influenced you. That's important to do a little bit, right? But you know how this can happen if, um, for some people who use therapy the wrong way, nothing is their fault, nothing is their responsibility. It's all my mother or my father, <laughs> right? It's all society, you know? There's a moment where it's useful to say, this came from my parents, this came from my society, this came from these bad experiences. There's a time when that's really important to do that and to be kind to yourself and to acknowledge that and then move on, yeah? Sometimes we don't feel like we have permission to move on because we've created the context for how we are. It feels like now that's fate. Do you know what I mean? Just really gently start to go, of course it makes sense that I'm angry, but do I have to stay angry? Of course it makes sense that I want these things and crave these things and get needy here and depressed there. Of course it makes sense, but do I need to stay that way? Yeah, so it's a gentleness while at, this, uh, at the same time a firmness. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop and have some lunch and um, just, you know, give it some space, give it some time. And um, let's see, it's 12.30 now, so if we come back at 1.30 or 2? 2. 2? Two. Two? Yeah. 2 is better. 2, okay, we'll come back at 2.